Well, good morning, everyone. This is the time scheduled for our virtual technical conference in docket number 22-057-02, Dominion Energy Utah's Integrated Resource Plan for plan year June 1st, 2022 to May 31st, 2023. My name is Jacob Richardson, and I am the PSC's facilitator for this conference. For the benefit of all who are participating in this technical conference, we ask that if you are not speaking, that you please mute your connection. We'll turn the time now to Dominion Energy. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, just want to introduce the uh, presenters today. So we've got Will Schwartzenbach, who manages our gas supply group. Uh, Will Radford, who is the project engineer on the LNG facility, and Mike Gill from our engineering group. Um, and Will is the star of the show. He has the most slides. So I'll turn the time over to him, and uh, we can get started. And I could virtually uh, see everybody cringe when you said that that I have the most slides. So um, I'll no, try and he, he will not be keep, doing keep any going. forty-five minute slides today, though. We promise. <laughs> okay. Um, so here to start off with, we just wanted to kind of talk about uh, what we're going to talk about in this conference and uh, the future ones that we have set up. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the IRP standards and guidelines and where you can find that information. Uh, we're going to go over the um, the order based on the 21-22 IRP and uh, what changes you'll see based on that. Then uh, Will Radford and Mike Giller are going to give us an update on our LNG uh, facility project. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Questar pipeline sale and, and what that means with our contracts that we have with them. Just give you an update on that. Uh, then we're going to have another meeting in April. Uh, that meeting will have a confidential section to it. Over the, the heating season, we'll also uh, review our uh, you know, talk about WexPro and our drilling program and um, go over kind of the results of our um, annual RFP, which actually uh, went out to our suppliers uh, this morning. So um, that'll be an April. Then we'll move on in May and have a, a pretty full agenda there with talking about rural expansion, the IRP. Uh, project details, so any uh, projects that are included in the IRP. Uh, we'll also uh, give a little overview of our long-term planning, which you'll see more of here, and then uh, update on our ability projects, and also an update on system integrity. Then we'll we'll file the IRP in mid-June, and we'll, uh, we'll have all the subject matter experts um, available for a presentation and review of that on June 28th for a technical conference. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about. If we <clears throat> move forward, the, the first item on our agenda for today is to, uh, we do this every year. We review the standard and guidelines and, and tell you from 2009, uh, that's kind of generally what, what guides our IRP. And then each year we um, have orders that kind of add to it or, or change it a little bit. But based on that uh, standard and guidelines, here's where you can find the information that was, was ordered in those uh, guidelines. Um, our changes to our customer growth, that will continue to be in the IRP in the customer and gas demand forecast section. Uh, any changes to our linear programming optimization model, that'll be found in the final model results section. Any changes to our DSM models will be in our energy efficiency section. Uh, our supply and demand forecasts, our send out and DSM results, uh, that will all be in our customer and gas demand section. The uh, gas quality Quality issues will be talked about in the gathering transportation and storage section. Uh, changes to our, our GNA models, which are our gas network analysis models. Uh, those, those will be abilities and constraints, um, as will the, the results of those models be in the system capabilities and constraints section. Uh, our, system, uh, our integrity management, sorry, uh, issues will be in the integrity management section. And... Um, any other issues to discuss, we'll, we'll schedule as needed. Many of those are already included on this agenda um, for our this or our remaining um, technical conferences. Are there any questions on, on this? Okay, sounds like we, we still have some people joining, so hopefully uh, I, I can say that you, you haven't missed a lot, just the, the agenda, and, and hopefully everybody's able to kind of catch up. Uh, the next thing to talk about is, you know, based on the, the standards and guidelines, then I said, you know, we have 
um, orders, which which also change what we need to include or, or say how we met those guidelines. Um, based on our 2022 IRP, um, we received an order where our Public Service Commission said that we uh, generally complies with the requirements of the standards and guidelines. Uh, so we're going to uh, that's why we're continuing moving forward with with similar objectives. Um, there were some additional commitments that we made based on feedback, um, and we've committed to do a number of things here, some of those things we've committed to. Um, we're going to include additional details related to any decisions to uh, what we're calling override the send-out models. These are operational decisions that we make that go against the send-out model. We will um, let you know about any of those. They'll, they're often in reports. They'll also be in the, the IRP. Um, we, we started last year, including a subsection labeled uh, long-term planning. That's within the system capability constraint of the IRP. We are going to um, include additional detail in that as much as we can. Um, so you'll, you'll see that there. Uh, we're interested to be updated with regards to the joint operating agreement that we have with, with Questar Pipeline that is going to continue going forward. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we're going to give a summary of the interruption analysis uh, conducted um, in future IRPs. So you'll you'll see more information on that. We do that every year, and we'll just uh, provide a little more detail. We are also going to provide additional information regarding gate stations in future IRPs. So uh, you'll see a little bit more detail regarding you know whether near capacity, at capacity, and and what our plans are for those. Uh, we're going to include total miles assessed under the integrity management section. So that's not something that we, we had before. So that'll be included in there. Um, we're going to explain the impact of, of the is that we initiate to our models um, in future IRP. So any, any take, and this is mainly referring to the, the send out modeling, but also to the GNA modeling or any modeling we do, we're, we're going to um, explain the impact of those, not just uh, what changes we make. Then, uh, we're going to provide greater detail about the material focused um, on the, or discussed in the IRP technical conferences. So anything we talk about in those technical conferences, we're going to the same amount of detail or more in the um, the IRP. And then uh, particularly this year, we're going to review the results of our hedging program, some of the changes that we made last year uh, going into this heating season and provide a proposal for future of the program. So we'll we'll talk about that in um, I believe that was the April um, technical conference. We'll also have more detail for that in the IRP itself. Next slide, Kelly. All right. Uh, the next thing I wanted to summarize is last week we had a stakeholder meeting. We're going to try and do this at least every year to uh, kind of get you know, a little, a little more personal feedback on, on what we can do better and, and uh, what additional changes that uh, we want to see. The attendees to that meeting were uh, representatives from, from Dominion and also uh, both the office and division division participated in that. And it's, it's good. Um, I see it as a, a very uh, casual conversation where uh, we can, we can get some, you know, uh, Pretty, pretty good feedback in terms of, of what we can do better. Um, some of the things that we discussed this time were concerns regarding the use of the send out model. A lot of these are things that are um, were also addressed in the order. Uh, so upper considerations for overriding, uh, why are the changes made to model programming and what impact? So again, it's, it's not just the changes that we make, but the impact. Um, we had a discussion on what would be included in the long-term planning sec subsection of the IRP uh, we requested some detail on how the um, joint operating agreement with the pipeline will be handled going forward. You're going to see some of that. Uh, there's a discussion uh, in the request uh, on basically some information on, on what's going to happen with the splitting of our gas controls. So distribution and uh, pipeline gas controls are going to be split as part of the, the sale of Questar pipeline. Um, then we're also going to, or, or we, we just of detail from the IRP technical conferences. So that's just going into more detail, not just highlighting what we talked about in the technical conference, but actually uh, including the same, same or more detail on, on each subject. Then um, we talked about the request to include information on loss and unaccounted for 
um, from first and second, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? Third parties. So first and second parties. Um, and then uh, a, a request to describe how the LNG facility will be utilized once it's completed. So uh, those are things we talked about in the, the stakeholder meeting. Those are things we're going to uh, address in the IRP going forward. Any questions? That meeting or what came out of it all right um this will be a really quick slide this is uh just an outline of what's going to be included in the irp and you may notice it looks uh very similar to last year's irp in terms of the the outline of it and how it's you have not added any new sections um i have highlighted in here that that long-term planning section is now located in system capabilities and constraints section so um, that'll just take a, a deeper dive into what we're planning to do going forward. All right, next slide, Kelly. All right, that's, you, you get a break from me for a little bit. I'm gonna turn it over to, to uh, I think, Mike Gill, that's gonna give you an update on the LNG facility. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm gonna take over and give an update. Am I coming through okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want to check there. All right. So, right. As you can see on this slide, we got a nice picture of the LNG tank there on the left. Um, on the right, we've got some percent complete um, for certain categories. As you can see, engineering, procurement, and fabrication are all essentially complete near or at 100%. Um, construction sitting right at 63%, and the overall total project is 74%. Um, just to give you a couple of details on the construction of the tank right now. Uh, the inner and outer walls are complete. Um, the roof is in place. We're planned for a hydro test, so a pressure test of the tank in March so next month. And then the paint, as you can see, the paint in that picture, paint's just kind of halfway done right now, but that'll be finished in April. Um, we'll install the pumps in May, and then we'll start building the containment berm around the tank in, um, in June. I'm going to skip to the next slide. I'll give a little bit of an update for the rest of the plant. So here on the left, you can see a nice picture of the plant um, taken just a few weeks ago from the top of the tank. So it's a nice overall view of the what we call the balance of plant. Um, right now, all concrete foundation work is complete. Uh, all major equipment is on site. Um, you can see the pipe racks in the picture. All the major pipe racks are in place now. Um, crews are mainly working on process piping, electrical trays, conduits, pulling, terminating wires. Um, and working on the buildings. There, there's four main buildings. Um, you can see one in the foreground there. That one's complete. That's got compressors in it. Um, there's one towards the right, kind of in the middle. That's the electrical building. That one's complete. We're just stacking equipment in there now. And then to the far right and to the back is our control building. The, the outer shell of that is complete and the roof is there and they're working on the internals. And the last building you can't really see, but they, they've begun erecting it and it's, um, it's, uh, the, the, the shell is kind of coming to place right now. Um, so, so all, all told, you know, our construction has been going on for about 15 months now, or over 15 months, and we've logged over a half a million uh, labor hours. Um, currently, we're sitting at our peak labor force of about 225 people on site. And all this told, um, we've only had one OSHA recordable incident over that whole time and zero environmental recordable instance. So it's really a stellar uh, record as far as environmental and safety compliance and performance in that regard. And, and, and all that still having great uh, performance on our construction. Um, Kelly, that was what I was prepared to deliver. I can certainly take any questions though on the current status of the project. Any questions on the schedule so far? All right, so pretty good news from uh, from Will. Uh, he gets to share the good news. I get to talk about some of the headwinds uh, we've had on the project. So going back to 2019, if you all remember, uh, during the pre-approval docket, uh, we hired a third-party contractor called HDR to come and, and give us an estimate of what we thought this facility would cost. And then we took that and kind of extrapolated it out and projected you know, how much we'd be spending each year and we adjusted that by what we thought was a good uh, inflation factor at the time. It was just a projection of CPI, which ended up being about 2.3% per year. 
And if you, any of you follow the economic indicators, you know uh, it has not come in at 2.3%. In fact, you know, in February, uh, they just announced, I think the CPI was at 7.5%. I think P, the PPI was actually higher at 9.7%. But we've also seen some, uh, some cost pressures on a lot of the inputs that we put into the facility. So here's just a couple of examples. Steel. Uh, has gone up 95% uh, during 2021, and copper 66%. In 2021, you'll see in a moment, was really the the lion's share of, of the uh, expenditures that occurred in 2021. So um, definitely, you know, these are COVID-related inflation issues. We're all facing it in other aspects of our life. Uh, you know, our, our own customers are, have seen a, a year-over-year increase in in, in uh, energy prices on their bills. Um, and so we're seeing in this in this facility as well. So that's one uh, pressure that we've seen. Another is just uh, COVID related um, scheduling issues. And so just to give you a couple examples, back in August of 2021, uh, we had a wave of, of COVID hit our tank welding group. And so, you know, they either had to be out sick or quarantined, and that uh, slowed that process down. Um, another example, supply chain issues, which I'm sure if any of you have tried to buy an appliance or furniture or, or something for your home, uh, you've probably seen, seen similar situations where, you know, things that were supposed to be here in, in two to three weeks took uh, several more weeks. And so as, as a result of all this, um, you know, in isolation, you can manage around around uh, one item, and and the schedule can can kind of stay on course. But when you have them stack up like this, um, in order to stay on schedule, like they've done a good job of staying on schedule, uh, it it requires you to uh, spend more money uh, in one way or the other. You you see cost increases, having to shift uh, resources around or bring in additional resources to stay on schedule. So um, we've seen some some cost pressures in, in all those areas related to COVID. So um, just to give you an idea of where we're at now, so the original pre-approval docket, uh, we got 211 million. 210 million was for uh, the expenditures through 2022. And then I think we had a million dollars in there for, uh, for expenditures in 2023. So as of right now, as of the end of December, um, we've spent 81% of the project, as, as Will mentioned, most of the procurement's done, so that's good. Uh, most of the fabrication's done, so really we're just focusing on constructing the, the facility at this point. Um, so we have, we feel like we have pretty good, uh, you know, certainty on, on where the costs are going to come in. Um, we're, we have a, a left to spend about $41 million. Um, between the, this year and beginning of next year. And so that uh, new estimate comes in at about 218 million. Uh, so the, the difference is we're seeing an overage uh, due to the COVID related impacts of about 7.2 million or, or three and a half percent. So I'll, I'll take any questions on this before I do. Um, you know, one question that I had, had anticipated is, you know, when did you know this was, was, this was happening? And we, we really began to get our arms around it uh, in mid-November is when uh, we started having internal discussions that, hey, you know, these, these uh, issues are kind of stacking up and, and we're starting to see some cost pressures. Our, our consultant was coming to us um, and, and, you know, making it known that, uh, that these were going to cause them to, to go over budget. Um, I think we got a really good feel for where we were at. Uh, by the end of December is where we we kind of uh, had a had a better feel for for these numbers and where we're at. So that gives you an idea of, of timing for us. As I mentioned, 2021 was was the big year for us, um, and so we really weren't aware that um, we were going to be in this situation until you know towards the end of the year, just because um, that's when most of the costs were coming in. So, any questions on uh, COVID-related impacts to the to the project? And I can't see hands. So, if, if uh, you have any questions, feel free to just uh, speak up. Okay. 
Uh, so one other issue we wanted to share, uh, Mike's going to talk about our thermal radiation zone. And I know many of you from the division are intimately involved with this uh, the situation and know the details. But for the broader group, we wanted to uh, give a little, little background and kind of where we're at on that as well. So go ahead there, Mike. Okay. Well, thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to... Uh, just spend a few minutes here talking about um, the exclusion zones, the need for exclusion zones, and what our remedy is um, with some covenant agreements that we've recently entered into. So um, by way of background, PHMSA and NFPA 59A code requires that uh, you conduct a thermal radiation exclusion zone analysis to identify any potential impact areas um, that may extend beyond your property lines. Um, that analysis prelim preliminarily was conducted in 2017 by uh, our consultant HDR who uh, assisted us with developing the feed study for this project. And there was two potential offsite impact areas that were identified, Kennecott at 15.4 acres and you can see that on the uh, on the slide, shaded purple, um, and Magna Water, which is the the green uh, square there, with a potential impact area of about 3.9 acres. Um, you can see the the circle that overlays both of those areas. That is the impact zone area. So it's not the entirety of those of those squares. Just the um, are overlaid with the circle. In 2017. HDR concluded by a strict reading of NFP 59A that the exclusion zone development and impacts only need to be considered at the time of siting. Um, however, uh, in working with PHMSA and reviewing a 2015 uh, response to some FAQs that PHMSA had, PHMSA, who is the code enforcement agency, uh, associated with this project has a different opinion and concluded that the uh, exclusion zones and control of those exclusion zones needed to be needed to occur for the life of the plant. So late 2020, uh, Matrix, HDR, and Dominion um, revised our conclusion, our 2017 conclusion, and determined that we needed to have control for the life of the plant of those areas identified uh, with the, uh, the circle. So we've, our solution to this was that to enter into uh, executed covenant agreements with both Magna Water and Kennecott that would explicitly restrict uh, activities within that area that would be in compliance with both PHMSA and NFP 59A code. Um, these covenant agreements are legally binding, they're durable, they are uh, will allow us long-term control over the uh, exclusion zones for the life of the plant. And um, we feel it was a win-win for both parties uh, or for all the parties involved with this uh, in terms of the, uh, the covenant agreements. So any questions on that? And while we're waiting for any questions, I will add, so these these covenant agreements were entered into at market prices um, and they, they ended up uh, being 4.7 million for, for all of them. Uh, now, because they're restricted covenants, they're not treated as part of the project, like we don't own them. They are treated as a prepaid asset that gets amortized over time. Um, so that would be the accounting treatment of them. But uh, that's that's where we stand on on that. And like Mike says, we believe this resolves the issue uh, going forward. So any questions on any of these items we've talked about so far? <clears throat> and this is uh, Bela with the office. Can you hear me? Hey, Bela. Yep. Um, good morning. Uh, I'm just trying to understand when you say exclusion zone, you mean there can't be any activity in those areas that produce heat that might affect the LNG facility or can you explain further? Yeah, so it, it's the other way around basically. So 
uh, thermal radiation, the thermal radiation zone would be in the incident of a fire of the LNG at the plant. So say we have a rupture of the tank, we've filled up the containment area and that LNG has caught fire. And basically the thermal radiation from that fire, there's different zones in which it would impact buildings and life within those zones. So um, what the intent of the exclusion zone is, is to ensure that there's no development or activities within that area such that if there was an incident or a fire, that uh, people would be people or buildings would be damaged or hurt. And so it's really to prohibit and restrict activities within those areas uh, that those landowners may engage in um, to prevent um, risk and prevent incidents from happening um, if there was was an emergency. Does that does that answer that, Bella? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, there you, there couldn't be any development within that circle. For example, any businesses or any residential areas, right? That's correct. Yep. And, so, and it even goes so far. I would add. Um, sorry, uh, but there really no activity. Um, like if you read the actual agreement, they can't put an escape room on that property or corn maze or, you know, have gatherings of larger than a certain number of people. So really the, in, in the, in exchange for the, the uh, money that we've given them, they, they really can't do much with the property. Um, so it's, it, it keeps it safe um, in case there's a, uh, an incident. Sorry, Bela, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. So, what about the the other the, the other areas in the square that aren't hollered in that are within the circle? What's what's the status of that property? I mean, there, couldn't there be develop development there in the future? There, yeah, there could be development, um, but if it's outside that circle, it's not a concern uh, in terms of life safety or building safety. Um, so if and, and just. For full disclosure, the the part on the west side uh, of that circle, uh, not that circle, the purple zone by uh, that Kennecott owns, on the west side or the left side of the page there, that is directly downstream or down right below their containment dam for their tailings ponds. Kennecott um, does not have any intention of developing that area at all. Uh, they they want to keep that area uh, clear. Um, that was why I was describing it as a win win. They don't have intent of of developing that area. We've met with Magna Water. They have no intention of of developing the area in the northwest corner of their property as well. Um, but we we felt we wanted to take these steps to just ensure that if if property was sold and people wanted to come in and put a building. Um, that we would have control over the activities uh, that would occur within those zones. So as long as it's outside the zones, they, they're free to um, develop those parcels as long as it doesn't interfere with the activities that are defined in the, uh, the covenant agreements. Yeah, yeah, I meant what, the area, that white square, you've got shaded, you've got oh. area to the north and area to the east. I guess, is that big white square, the entire parcel that Dominion owns? Or I'm Yeah, to okay. I, I, I apologize. Yes. So the, the white square is the 160 acres that we own. So we, we control the entirety of the white square, the, the light white square. And then the shaded white square is the developed area for the plant currently. Oh, so the, the larger white square that's just outlined you own that property that was part of the purchase of of this yes or this development yeah that was part of the initial property uh purchase of it's 160 acres that we control okay. within that light white square just trying to clarify thank you you bet and we purchased that Thanks. back in 2020 right beginning of 2020 is that the right timing on that uh, I think it was a little bit before 2020, but yeah, before the start of the project, obviously. Justin has a question. Yeah, just a very brief question. Um, is is the area shown on this map representing the full 
exclusion zone. Um, I guess that's yeah. sort of the question that that is: is there more outside of this that that's also included, or or is it sort of a um, the property that you control? You don't need to worry about, and so it's yeah, it's basically those two other properties that are all that you're within the whatever you call that the range. Yeah. So the only other impacted properties are the ones that we're showing here. Um, the remainder of the exclusion zone mapping uh, lies within our property. So the if you look at the the slide, the lightly shaded circle the areas that kind of overlay both the the darker um, triangle or rectangle areas, that is the extent of the exclusion zone on those properties. Okay, that I, I see what you're looking at now, and it makes a lot of sense to me. The the sort of I don't know blue purple shaded Kennecott area, yeah, uh, outside of that circle's boundary, that would be still you know sort of open to their use and development. And it looks like there's at least one building on uh, maybe the south side of that if if this is facing north. Right. Yeah. And that, I, that's actually, I don't think it's a building. Um, I think it's like a, an open, uh, field for like training horses and that sort of thing. If I remember correctly, I don't, I don't think it's a building, but yes, your point, your point is correct. It's, um, the darker shaded areas are still open for their development. It's the light circle areas that we're talking about with these, uh, covenant agreements. Okay. Thanks. I, I think, I think it makes perfect sense, and I just didn't look closely at the map to understand that circle. I apologize for that. No, no, good no, questions. No. We were, we were confused when we saw the map, too, so good good clarifying questions. Yep. Uh, this is John Harvey with just a question for me to help me understand this. Uh, when you talk about the exclusion zone, I, I assumed it would be a complete circle because an explosion would kind of go in any direction. Um, Correct. Yep. But you're showing nothing to the north, northeast, or east. Yeah, we're just not showing the what, what, what we were trying to demonstrate with this, and maybe we we failed. We were trying to demonstrate the area of the impact circle that affected other properties. The, the balance of the the impact circle is, is on our property. Um, so by code, we, we have control or had control over that area. And so we didn't identify it in this particular picture. Um, oh, so, so the, the 160 is the white outline, not just the white. That's correct. Uh, all yeah. right. Okay. Got it now. Thanks. Yep. You bet. I will say this is Chris at Division of Public Utilities. Our pipeline safety folks have worked, have spent more time than I think Kelly or I ever thought they would working on issues involving this exclusion zone and and the agreements that Dominion has entered into. We've consulted with FIMSA multiple times back and forth on this. So this is something we've been monitoring as well. Yeah, I really appreciate, like you said, uh, your work on this. I think um, we've, we've all spent <laughs> maybe a lot more time than we needed to, but but to Mike's point earlier, I think I think hopefully now we've got a, a long term solution in place that um, that satisfies everyone. So, okay. Any other questions? Good good discussion on uh, on the exclusion zone. So, a couple questions that I had, um, you know, once we we kind of fine tune these numbers, is um, if you recall back in the uh, pre-approval docket, we we had chosen the LNG facility, uh, and and it had it had kind of I'm going to use an Olympic uh, you know analogy. Hopefully, everyone's not tired of the Olympics by this at this point. But it was the uh, you know top of the podium, first place, uh, due for for a couple of reasons. One was the qualitative reasons. Um, you know, it was, it was, uh, the location was, was right where we needed it to be in the, in the center of our, uh, demand system demand. And then also the fact that we had complete control over it, uh, we found that to be beneficial. And then also in terms of cost, it came in as the lowest cost option. 
So the question I had was, okay, well, assuming everything's the same, but we now are able to, we, we know the numbers a little bit better. What does that do to the, the uh, order on cost? And so what I've done here, and, and I, I presented it this way because I didn't want to have to make the slide confidential, but it, I think it gives you the, uh, the idea of, of, of where we're at. You can see on the left side, um, and I'm not even going to uh, tell you what option two and three were, you, you probably remember, um, but uh, when we originally got approval, you can see we, we beat the next lowest cost option by about 1.6 million. Um, and I went back and reran the numbers. I put in the $7.2 million of, of uh, COVID-related issues, as well as that uh, $4.7 million thermal radiation uh, zone. And uh, we still uh, are the lowest cost, not by as much. Um, it's gone up by about 1.1 million, but we're, we're still there. Um, another question that, that I had um, that we discussed internally is, okay, so, you know, we got this approved originally under the pre-approval docket. That docket does allow us to come in if we know that there's going to be, uh, you know, a change in, in uh, cost estimates, and we could file with the commission under the same statute uh, and, and ask to expand the budget by the, the necessary amount. Uh, and I think the statute allows us to file that and, and we get a commission determination within 60 days. So that's one option. I, we've, we have opted to just wait until the rate case. Um, a couple of reasons for that. We think that gives parties more time to, to get their, um, their arms around the, the details. But also, you know, if we were to do a pre-approval, we probably would have filed in February because we didn't really know about this till the middle of December. So we would have had maybe maybe some uh, certainty by April, but um, we feel like by waiting until the rate case when we file in May, um, you know, that rate case will be ongoing through the second, third quarters. And so by the time we get to a hearing in the rate case, we'll have pretty good certainty on the, the final cost of the project. By that time, the, the project, is, as Will mentioned earlier, will be really substantially complete and we'll have a better feel. So, um, if, if anyone's wondering, you know, why, why didn't you just, just, just come in during, uh, under the pre-approval statute? That was the thinking uh, behind uh, our, our decision-making. So, so that's uh, kind of how we've decided we're going to treat it um, going forward is just in the general rate case. So I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a con that concludes the discussion on LNG facility. Anybody have any final questions? All right, I'll turn it over to Will and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Questar Pipeline and contracts. Still there, Will? I am still there. I was just waiting for the slide to change, but uh, I'm back. Hopefully everybody can Thank see you. and hear me. Um, all right, so uh, as many of you may uh, know, uh, Dominion Energy has uh, finalize the sale of Questor Pipeline. Why don't we switch to the, the next slide there, Kelly? There we go. Uh, so on December 31st of 2021, so this, this past uh, New Year's Eve, Dominion Energy announced the closing of the sale of Questar Pipeline. Um, originally last year at this time, I think we were talking about the sale to uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, now they, they finalized the sale with uh, Southwest Gas Holdings. Uh, for 1.975 billion, so um, that is is done, and they are sold off. We're we're currently in the process of of transitioning. The that sale uh, includes all transportation and storage assets in Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. So basically, all of Questar Pipeline, Overthrust Pipeline, um, as it relates to us, Clay Basin Storage and Aquifer Facilities. Those are those are all sold as part of this this deal. Um, so as far as the the impact on the gas supply, I'm not going to talk about all the, you know, all through up and down the company, every operational change, but the impact on on the gas supply service to uh, Dominion Energy, Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho, I wanted to kind of elaborate what, what that means. Um, one of the, the bigger things is that our joint gas control that, that we've had for years is now going to be uh, split. We will have a separate distribution gas control 
and uh, Questar Pipeline, or um, they're, they, they are getting ready to announce a new name, um, but for now we'll call them Questar Pipeline. Uh, they'll have their, their own gas control and they will be separated. We're in the process of, of physically doing that right now. Um, again, there's about a year transition for a lot of this stuff. So I'm just going to talk about kind of future state. Um, the, the other change that we see is the confirmation and scheduling functions um, will transition uh, to Dominion Energy, Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho. So um, previously, the, there was a couple of functions that were on the kind of the quorum side, if, if you look at it that way, but it's, it's really the system that gets maintained for um, customers to go in and schedule their gas on the distribution system. That was done through Quorum, which was the same as, as Questar Pipeline system. And folks from Questar Pipeline actually managed that process. So they did all the uh, confirming and scheduling. Even though it was a separate instance, you went in to the, the distribution pipe. Um, they, it was managed by, by Questar Pipeline employees. That will be transitioning over to uh, Dominion employees to do that as well. And along with that went some of the, the contract management functions as well. They, they did that within Quorum. All of that will now transition to us. The, um, the, the next thing is our, our contracts. And this is probably the biggest one. This we're going to go into a little bit more detail here. But um, all of our transportation contracts that we have with Questar Pipeline, uh, none of them will be, be negatively impacted. And I'm going to go through contract by contract and just kind of highlight all of that. Um, but the last thing I wanted to touch on was the the joint operating agreement. As of now, we're 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 planning to continue uh, with the joint operating agreement just as we had before. Um, I don't know. There there may be some changes to some of the appendixes, but but really the the meat of it is it as it uh, impacts gas supply is going to stay the same. Where our uh, planning group meets with their planning group and or. Kind of sends back and forth and says, "Here's what our our flows are going to look like. How we're going to spread that between the gates, um, and this is what it looks like on the pipeline side." And they pass that information back and forth. Um, so that will continue going forward. There may be some some tweaks to it here and there, but it's it's in overall, it's going to stay the same. Any questions before I I dive right into the the contracts? Yeah, well, this is Eric. I have a question. Um, hey, Eric. Hey. Um, has there been any talk about some of the assets that Southwest may not want to keep that they want to sell back to Questar? Um, have you have you heard of any of that? I have not been part of any discussions on that. As far as I know, everything that that was sold to them is is going to to Southwest Gas. So. I don't know anything about trying to give anything back. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions before we move forward? I'll just note that I saw Colleen Bell coming out of your building with a Dominion employee badge the other day and had flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're ahead of me because because I work in that building and I haven't seen her back yet. So that does remind um, me, Will, I have another question. Okay. Um, will Southwest be using your building and facilities in the same control room, or are they going to be off-site? So as, as far as I'm aware, they are going to stay um, on just the third floor of our building and have that control room. And again, the, the control room, gas control, will be split out, and we're going to – we're – um, building our own control room over in the uh, the DNR our operations center over there, okay. but they're they're still going to stay in the third floor, from from what I've been told. Thanks. And I I know uh, the the sad news is that a lot of people have asked this, but but I am strictly a uh, distribution employee, and my group is all distribution, so nothing really changes for me. I'm still going to be here. I'm still on the, the Dominion energy side. So I know few people have had that question, but just to, just to be clear, you're still stuck with me. We're glad we still have you, Will. <laughs> all right. The, uh, why don't we move forward to the next slide and we'll dig into all of our contracts with them. And I'll just kind of give you an update on, on where they all stand and, and what needs to be done with some of them. So 
All right. Uh, we're going to start off talking about our transportation contracts. Oh, I think you skipped two. There you go. Um, transportation contracts. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details on the contracts. I'm just going to kind of highlight the ones that are are uh, need to be discussed. So contract 241, that was renewed just a few years ago in 2017. I guess we are halfway through that. Time flies when you're having fun. But but that contract doesn't expire till 2027. So there's really no no impact of this sale at all. We'll continue with that contract just as we would, and, and we'll evaluate it as the, the term expiration gets closer. Um, I can say the same for um, contract 6136. Most of you probably don't recognize that, uh, that contract number because it's not really been talked about much before. That's the Hiram expansion addendum we did back in 2017 as well. So that added some capacity at, uh, at our Hiram station. And it, everything about that contract just goes right along with the uh, 241, but it is technically a separate contract. Um, again, no, no impact because it, it does go for another five years. Uh, no need to change anything. We'll, we'll look at it as, as it gets closer. Uh, 2945, this one's not highlighted, but it is, oh, Kelly, Sorry. I think you skipped. It's coming back. It's coming back. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, so 2945 isn't highlighted because we don't have to take any, any action on it. Um, and the reason we don't have to is because we already have. Um, so this contract was renewed uh, recently. Uh, again, we try and do that as part of the, the IRP cycle, but this one we, we felt we wanted to move forward on. Um, so that renewal will be effective uh, April 1st. And that was the, so this contract was in Evergreen previously. Um, so it was just going year to year. And uh, the, the current year of that Evergreen would, will expire at the end of March. We, we wanted to make sure we renewed this one so it'll renew uh, April 1st and go for five years. Uh, the reason we wanted to do that is we have very favorable terms on that contract. It's not uh, necessarily a max rate type contract because um, if you'll recall, that is our seasonal capacity. Uh, it uses overthrust pipeline, which is capacity that is in high demand right now. And it gives us access to some some key receipt points. So this is, uh, a, to, to put it simply, it's a really good deal that we we didn't want to lose out on. So we wanted to make sure that uh, while they were willing to renegotiate that deal and and do it going forward, uh, we we wanted to move on that before you know because the we we don't necessarily know what their strategies will be going forward. So we we wanted to make sure we we lock that up going forward. Um, we've done that already and. We'll, we'll talk about that in the IRP as well. Uh, the next contract on here is highlighted. This is contract 2361. Um, that is currently similar to what 2945 was. That's, that's in a year-to-year -year evergreen. So that contract right now goes, from, uh, goes through November of 22. Um, so that'll go through uh, to, to this November. Um, it is a max rate contract, um, so it, it's it's definitely uh, useful in terms of what we use it for. We use it to serve uh, Indianola, which goes down to our southern system. Uh, it is in demand capacity and everything, but being that it's at a max rate, uh, we do want to lock that up for a longer term rather than going uh, year to year. So we'll probably look at a five-year contract on there. Uh, but because it is at a max rate, we didn't feel like it was at at risk currently to to not having that uh, be offered back to us because we do have max rate we we actually have a right of first refusal so um, we're gonna include that analysis as part of the um, IRP you'll see it in there but uh, right now we're we're considering going um, for another five years in that contract just didn't didn't have the urgency to do it uh, right now before we we went through and and described that uh, analysis in the in the IRP. Uh, the next contract that we have transportation wise is 6546. That's, uh, you'll recall, is a recent one that we did last year. It is for overthrust capacity. It's about 8,000, just over 8,000 decatherms of capacity. So it is a small contract. It basically just the extends the, the path on some of our capacity of 241 uh, back to some, some better receipt points. So uh, that was a small contract that uses overthrust capacity that allows us to do that. Um, that one doesn't expire until 2027, as with the others. So 
uh, again, there's it doesn't change. No real need to change anything on that contract. And that that's kind of it for our our uh, transportation contracts with them. Are there any questions on those before we move forward to some of the other services? All right. Um, hearing none, we'll we'll move forward to some of our other services we have with them. So, namely, firm peaking service and no notice. Uh, the firm peaking service is actually the way it's it's technically done is in a, are through addendums to contract two forty one. Um, last year, because we we had those contracts were kind of in flux due to the um, the potential sale, we were going on a month to month basis uh, through this heating season. So up until uh, just a few days ago, February 14th, um, or actually that was, that was last year for, for 2020, 2021. Um, those were month to month. We, we did extend these prior to this heating season. So this year we were covered um, through this February and we did those for three years uh, through 2024. Um, as you recall, when it looked at the, the need, when we looked at the need for that service, uh, these were the most cost effective solutions. They continue to be um, but as we go forward, we will continue to, to seek additional options for meeting the need. Uh, we'll look at things like uh, storage. You know, we we talked about at some point, maybe um, once the LNG facility is in and operating, looking at expanding that to, to meet this need as well. So uh, we're going to continue to look at those options, but we're, we're covered for the next uh, next two heating seasons now that we've, we've finished the first one. So all the way through 2024. Um the next one to talk about is no notice transportation. This is uh, it's technically contract 987. Uh, that is our no notice. It's a very um, effective solution for adjusting our, our nominations. Uh, that contract is currently in Evergreen. Um, so it's been in year to year Evergreen for quite some time. It, uh, it goes through June of this year. Uh, that is a max rate contract. So, so going back, it, it's uh, we are, paying the max rate for it. But I, I do have some concerns because it, it reserves capacity on the pipeline to allow for those adjustments. And the only the only concern I have is whether or not, um, you know, they, they could look for additional opportunities to use that capacity, maybe not offer the no notice, um, be able to offer as much to us anymore if they decide to use it for something else. Um, that capacity is significantly less expensive um, on a no notice transportation basis than if we were to say buy it at firm transportation. And I, I'm not aware if they can just convert it to firm transportation. But if, if you want to compare the cost, the the monthly rate for no notice service is 86 cents as a po per decatherm as opposed to five dollars and twenty eight cents for firm transportation. So it, it reserves that capacity for us and gives us great value. Um, so we we think, and we're going to put this analysis in in the IRP. We'll we'll talk about it because um, again, we have until till February. But we we think we we may want to do a longer term contract than letting it just go to year to year. So possibly a five year. Um, but we're going to um, look at that evaluation uh, because it is June thirtieth, and I, I think our our notification period will be then before the IRP is due. Um, we're going to evaluate it, uh, include that in the IRP, but we may choose to act on that prior to um, prior to that June 30th date. So prior to the filing of the IRP. So that's just something we, we wanted you to be aware of. And that's why it's highlighted here in blue. Any so, questions so on Will, those? Would you, say, would you say we're leaning towards renewing it for a longer term? Yeah, I'd say we're, we're, uh, we're leaning towards... Yeah, leaning towards a five-year evaluation. I am gonna, you know, continue to do the analysis this year um, leading up to that. But right now, it it, it does look like we're leaning towards um, a five-year term on that. Any questions on those before we move on to storage? All right, uh, storage. We have both clay basin and the aquifers. Clay basin. Uh, just to remind everybody, we are one of several. Uh, shippers in the clay basin facility. We do have three contracts, three separate contracts um, there. And then the aquifers, we're the only shipper and we have all of the capacity on, on three separate contracts, one for each facility. Um, looking at clay basin, uh, two of the contracts, 997 and 935, still have some time before the renewal. 
um, time for us to evaluate them. Uh, contract 988 does expire this April. Um, so we, we've got to move on that one now. That storage is in high demand. Um, it's required for operations. I mean, it, it provides us numerous operational benefits. Um, we also uh, use it for, for hedging. When you talk about our, our hedging options, uh, storage is one of them and, and Clay Basin is, is pretty much the best around. Um, so we are planning to renew that prior to the term expiration in April. So that will be done uh, soon and we will include that analysis in the IRP. So um, I'm, I'm telling you right now, we, we do want to um, extend that. So it will be done um, in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, as far as the, the aquifers go, um, all three of those contracts uh, don't expire till August of 2023. Uh, so we will be analyzing them soon. They're probably next on, on the, the list to, to analyze and see what we want to do for 2023. Uh, but we will have some some time to go over that about evaluation with you guys before um, we do that. So, um, any questions on storage? All right. Well, that's that's actually all we have. It, um, I guess in in summary, though, you know, uh, they they may change names, they may change ownership, but the reality is our our relationship with them will will stay very similar. Um, you know, we, we've always had to deal in an arm's length and um, it'll, it'll stay the same, the exception of, like I said, gas control splitting and some, some small stuff. It'll be very similar and our contracts will stay in place. All right, thanks, Will. So uh, last chance for any questions about anything we've covered today. All right. Uh, I think our next IRP tech conference is scheduled for April 19th at 1.30. So uh, we'll, we'll see you all then with more exciting topics to discuss. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. That concludes our technical conference. Thank you.